Hello, Citadel. This is John Harkey. It's so good to see you. We want to greet you. We so miss you. We love you dearly. We want to encourage you because in a moment, there's going to be a great word that's going to be spoken. I pray that it blesses you, that it empowers you. I pray that it equips you. We miss you and can't wait to see you next week, Wednesday. Now we are. Hi, Citadel. We are so blessed, so excited. Uh, for you guys, I tell you what, I'm so happy what God is doing in our church. And I just want to encourage you guys that it's going to be, you guys are going to watch a powerful message. And it will encourage you, build your faith. And we can't wait to see you guys. We miss you guys. Yes, but we can't we wait to see you guys this Wednesday. All right? Love you guys. Bye-bye. You know, last night I was talking about the evolution of the prophetic voice. And I mentioned Moses' sense of justice. And I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but I'm going to go in, back into it, and then we're going to look at a verse of Scripture in Exodus 2, verse 16, 17, 18, and 19, just four verses. But I want to say something to you. How many know that we can't sustain revival without a structure? That we need structure. Every church needs structure. Every organization needs structure. Uh, I used to think prior to 2021 that we needed to get rid of, of structure. Let me just tell you, I wouldn't have a church plant if there wasn't some kind of structure. If there wasn't structure, our, our, we, our church could not function when Meliana and I are away. And I realized that uh, there, there is something I want to tell you that you know, when, when Moses' mother actually put uh, Moses in the Nile, it, it, she actually obeyed Pharaoh. She actually obeyed Pharaoh. But what she, did, what she didn't tell Pharaoh is that she built a structure in order to sustain Moses during that season while he was in the Nile. And that's why every church, every home, every child needs structure in the home. Come on. Every organization. And then we, we, we find out that, that uh, Pharaoh's daughter pulls Moses out of the water. And I have never seen this before because it impacted me so much. I, I, in fact, I, when, when I discovered this, I literally fell on my knees and wept. Because in Exodus 2, it never tells us her name. Brother, it never tells her her name. But her name is actually mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 18. And her name was Bithia, Bonnie. And the word Bithia in the Hebrew means worshiper of God. Isn't it interesting that the worshipers rescue the prophetic from drowning? Oh, isn't it mean that it's the worship? It's the worship that rescues the word. Oh, come on! Are you hearing me? And 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 then we find out, as I read last night briefly, that you know Moses goes out and he's looking at the burdens. He's looking at the burdens of God's people, and he and he, and, he, and he feels this this sense of justice rise up in him. And there has been so much said about that incident in Moses' life that. Because we could argue his theologically and doctrinally where his actions were correct in murdering the Egyptians. Some, some streams would say, oh, that was wrong. Others would say it was an act of justice. It depends about who you read or who you study. But I take on, I take on this personally. I take on the fact that it's not what one camp says and what another camp says. It's what the Word of God says. Because sometimes we can lean over to a camp but not study the Word of God. Because I'm, I'm going to just, can't, I'm going to have you go back to Exodus 2 in a moment. But I want you to turn all the way over to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24. Because, because while you're turning there, I want to read something in Exodus 2 so you can track with me. Now it came to pass, verse 11, now it came to pass in those days Moses was grown. He went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a, beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, that way, verse 12, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian 
and hid him in the sand. And he went out this, on the second day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting. And he said to, to the one who did the wrong, why are you striking your companion? Then he said, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop right there. Turn all the way over to Hebrews chapter 11. Are you there? Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. I want you to see this because I, I want to clear some misinformation. Why did Moses leave? Listen to this, verse 24, by faith. Everybody say, by faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, by faith. Can I tell you something right now? The Word of God says he didn't leave uh, in Hebrews, I believe what Hebrews says, that he didn't leave, leave Meliana by fear. He left by faith. Come on. By faith. Now listen to this. It's very detailed. By faith, Moses, when he, became, uh, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In other words, he did not find his identity in the palace. He did not find his identity in Egypt. He found his identity in God and with God's people. The moment we attempt to find our identity in the world, we miss who we really are. We have been defined by God, and we've been defined by God's people. And if I want to know who I am, I come to church. Come on. And so at that moment, he says, I don't want to be identified with a nation that murders babies. Hear me. I don't want to be identified with people who are tyrannical and suppressing God's people. I don't want to be identified with that. Come on. So at that moment, it says, now this, verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with God's people than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Church, can I tell you something? He didn't run from Pharaoh because he was just afraid. He, run, he, ran, he ran away to Midian because he didn't want to yoke himself with the sin of Egypt. Oh, come on. And being in a position of a prince, he did not want to do that. He would rather be a man in the wilderness and be, live in the wilderness than live in the palace. Can I hear an amen? So then, listen to what it says. It, it, it then says, Esteeming the reproach of Christ of greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, he looked forward to his reward. I love this, verse 27. By faith, he, for, by faith, didn't say because he was afraid of his own people or afraid of Pharaoh. It says, by faith, he forsook Egypt. Do you have anybody that know what I'm talking about? How many know when you forsake something that you don't belong to, God has a way of rewarding you? He forsook, he forsook, excuse me, Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You know what I love about the prophetic? What the prophetic does is the prophetic doesn't see what's in front of them. A, a, a prophetic sees what it cannot see. And it goes after something it cannot see. It goes from something that it, it, something that is, is believed that I don't know why I'm leaving, but I know that I don't belong here. I don't know why I'm going out in the wilderness. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm dealing with this right now, but I know there's something invisible. Come on. And at that moment, Mo, Mo, Moses begins to make his journey. Now, I could, we could argue that yes. Yes, it was, it could have been maybe the, the actions of murdering an Egyptian wasn't the wisest thing to do, but it happened. How many have ever commit, made a mistake? How many ever made some unwise choices and made unwise decisions in your life? Aren't you thankful they don't define you? Aren't, they don't, aren't you thankful that you don't find your identity in your unwise decisions, that you find your identity in his wisdom? But see this. I'm going to turn back now. We're going to spend the rest of the evening on Exodus 2, 16 through 19. 
because I want you to see this. It's very, very powerful because this is a prophetic word to all of us and especially to my wife and I. Now, now listen, he's out in the wilderness. He's never lived there. This is a new territory. He grew up in Pharaoh's daughter's household. He doesn't live out there. And he's wandering out there many miles away from Egypt. Now listen to this. Now the priest of Midian, which was Jephro, had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs of water to water their father's flock. Church, I want, to look at, I want you to see this as an allegory, as a parable. These women are shepherds. We got a woman shepherd right over here. We got another woman shepherd right over here. We got so how many women shepherds? Come on, we got. How many women that feel called of God? Come on, I called. I've got a women shepherd right there. I've got two women shepherds. I got a three right here in this row, right there. Three women shepherds right there. Do I have any women shepherds? Come on. This is God introducing a woman as a shepherd. Jephro doesn't have sons. He has daughters. Come on. So what do shepherds do? Shepherds don't just do administration. Shepherds don't just do go, come to church and back and forth. Shepherds' primary job is to water the flock. Oh, come on. How many know that right now in, our, in America, there is all kinds of problems with all kinds of churches? Because shepherds aren't doing their job. Shepherd, shepherds aren't watering their flock. They're too busy putting on a show. Oh, come on, come on. You know what I'm talking about. Because our real responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, is to water the flock. And I don't know why you have to have something on stage in order to appeal to a crowd when you should be watering the flock. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And what is happening is that we're looking for entertainment rather than doing our full responsibility to water God's people. That's what they were doing. That's what their, that was their job. Now Moses is kind of observing this whole scenario. And so what happens in the next verse is quite interesting and quite prophetic today. Because this is what it says, Meliana. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. Everybody say, the shepherds came and drove them away. So here are these people, these women that are shepherds that want to water their flock. Now here come some other shepherds that don't care about the flock. And they drive them away. When I read that, ladies and gentlemen, something crossed my mind. I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't want to be the kind of shepherd that drive people away. I don't want to be the kind of person that offend people. I don't want to be the kind of person that undermine you, that, that people cause to question what I say and want to do. I want to be a shepherd of integrity. I want to be a, she a shepherd of righteousness. I want to be like Pastor Tom when I get up, grow up. Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You, aren't you thankful you got a shepherd with integrity? Aren't you, got a, aren't you thankful that you got a shepherd? that isn't trying to drive people away. I don't want to drive people away. I want them to get them in the house. Come on. But I'm seeing this across the country and across the globe that many shepherds are concerned about watering themselves instead of watering the flock. So then they're more concerned about defending their actions rather than watering the flock, and they stop preaching the gospel. Or take the gospel out of context. But listen to what these shepherds do. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But I love this. Now you have to understand this because in reality, Moses is in the biggest crisis of his life. You follow what I'm saying? He's in the wilderness when he grew up in the palace. He's now a fugitive and a criminal by the state of Egypt, his own people have rejected him, and now he's in the biggest crisis up to this point. 
And then what's amazed me is that how many have ever had crisis before? How many have ever had large crisis before? And, and you know what? Who we are in our calling happens when we're in crisis. Are you hearing me? Because, because our real personality, our real gifting will rise up in the middle of crisis. So when the crisis hits, because there's not Meliana, according to Meliana, trouble comes. Come on. But when the crisis hits, what am I going to do? Now, here's what I love. Moses stood up. Everybody say, stood up. Is there anybody, come on, is there anybody? Now, he has a personal crisis in his own life. But he sees something that is unjust. That there are shepherds that are chasing away these other women, these other shepherds from watering their flock. So their flock is not watered. So Moses doesn't just sit back and say, I'm going to just let that happen. I'm just going to let God's people not, not drink from the river of life. Come on. I'm not going to let God's people drink from the well. I'm not going to sit back there and let this happen. I'm going to do something about it. And so he's in his own individual crisis. And let me just tell you, you can be in a crisis but you're not a hypocrite when you stand for justice. Oh, come on, come on. You're not a hypocrite when you stand up because God wants to water his people. God wants to feed his people. There isn't a, a month that goes by. I mean, I don't even think there's a couple weeks that go by that in Melian in our conversation, we go all the way back to, back to, forward to John 21 and feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Feed my lambs. Come on, are you hearing? There's not something. Because let me tell you, we can be all prophetic, but if we're not feeding people, what are we doing? And Moses stood up. And I really feel that right now in the house of the Lord at New Life Bowling Green, Kentucky, right tonight, there's a group of people, yeah, we got issues. Yeah, we got our own personal problems. But it's not going to stop us from standing up. Come on. Now, think about this. This is a test. It's a test for Moses. Because if you can't stand up for this flock, how are you going to stand up for Israel? Oh, come on. If you can't stand up and take care of this small group of people, how in the world are you going to take care of all of Israel? And he stands up, and I love this, because in this context, which I believe he learned, and what is beautiful, Meliana, is that he didn't kill the shepherds. <laughs> like he killed the Egyptians. Oh, come on. Which tells me you learn from your, you learn, if you don't learn from your immaturity from the last season, you're a fool. He learned from his actions in the past and realized I can, I can, I can take care of the conflict without murder. Because I'm sure if you've ever been to church, you felt like killing somebody. <laughs> Are you hearing? You know what I'm talking about. They made you so mad you felt like killing them. But you learned you better not behave that way. Come on. Because it really could get you in trouble. And I'm not just literally killing him. I'm killing him with your words, killing him with your attitude, killing him with your actions, ki killing them with your behavior, you know what I'm saying, or your rejection or whatever. But he doesn't kill the shepherds. What he does is, is so beautiful, it says... Moses stood up, and this is what he did, and helped them. And he, and he, the shepherds came, drove them away. Then it says, then Moses stood up and helped them. Everybody say, help them. One translation said, he chased them away. Can I tell you something? You have every right. You have every right. This prophet is going to tell you, you have every right. If someone doesn't feed the flock or shepherd the flock, you have every right not to tolerate that. Are you, are you talking about? I don't know about you, but every time, I mean, I can tell you something. Pastor Tom fed me yesterday morning. 
He read a scripture out of Luke chapter 11, 42. I spent the whole morning in Luke 11, chapter 42. The whole morning on that verse. He fed me. Verse 42. I spent that whole, that whole morning, this whole morning, and it just blessed me because I began to see things, not just about tithing. Well, it was a great teaching on tithing. Wasn't it a great teaching on tithing? But I saw something else that it says, you neglect justice and the love of God. Because I know people that, uh, Pastor Renee, that don't neglect the love of God, but they neglect justice. So God was saying, you got to have both. And it just blessed my socks off. And so I actually put it in my book, you know. But anyhow, he helps them, and what does he do? Watered their flock. Everybody say, watered their flock. Church, go, how many leaders in the house? How many leaders in the house? I pray that all of you, all of, you, know, you know, Amanda and Becky and Dahlia, I don't see Becky, but, but Becky is usually in the middle. <laughs> but maybe God's called you to water Lithuania. All right, come on, think about that. Maybe, maybe God has called Pastor Renee to water Kaneohe. Maybe God has called Pastor Tom and Cindy to water Bowling Green. Oh, come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? Because every, every, and sometimes we got to let the shepherd water the flock. And I want to do whatever I can to allow the shepherd to do their job. Come on. Because I know how thirsty I am. I know how much I need water. But listen to this. It says, so they water their flock. Then, now verse 18, it goes on to say this. It says, when they came to Ruel, which is, it's interesting that the translators use that name. It's actually Jephro. Their father, he said, this is interesting. How is it that you have come so soon today? So when I, read, when I read that, I began to think about this. Obviously, there had been a pattern that these women would go, these daughters, these shepherds would go water their flock. And it would take several days to do that because they were constantly being chased away by some people some that were stronger. They were constantly being chased away by male shepherds. And... It took them several days to finally get their flock watered. And now they literally came back very soon. And Jephro is wondering, how come you're back so quickly? Which tells me what Moses did. Even in his own personal crisis, he broke the dysfunction off that situation. Oh, come on. He broke the dysfunction. He did not allow that injustice to continue. So then they answer their father, and, and this is amazing. And they said, an Egyptian. Everybody say an Egyptian. Which means to tell me, Meliana, Moses looked like an Egyptian. Didn't look like a shepherd and didn't look like a prophet. Which means they failed to recognize who he was again. An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he, listen to this, and he also drew water enough for us. Everybody say, he drew water for us. Church, please don't forget what I'm going to tell you. Do you know what I want to do when I come to Bowling Green? When I go to every church, when I go to every conference, I just don't want to water the flock. I want to water the shepherds. Do you realize, do you realize if your goal was not just to come to drink, your, your goal was to come to water Pastor Tom and Pastor Cindy? Oh, come on. And water your leaders. Are you hearing what kind of what kind of power would be in this room? 
What would happen if churches across America got the idea that I'm not here to confront my pastor. I'm not here to disobey my pastor. I'm not here to make, give the pastor a hard time. I'm here to water my shepherd. Oh, come on. What, what if every deacon in this church or every, every uh, this, this church doesn't have a quote, the board, and that's okay, and that's probably more New Testament, you know what I'm saying? But they have a, an advisory board or deacons and things like that. What if every board member or every deacon didn't say, I'm not here to disagree with you, I'm here to water you? What, what, what kind of unity would happen in the church? What kind of breakthrough? I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, revival would break out. I guarantee you a move of God would happen because we're not just concerned about us. We want our leaders watered because we know if they're not watered, they cannot water the flock. Oh, come on. And I, honestly, I, uh, I, I was talking to a group of people that wanted to be in the ministry a few months ago, and uh, someone asked me a question, Brother Harkey, what sustains you on the road? Well, I said, first of all, obviously you're going to water the flock. But if you water the shepherds, you will never have to worry about a place to preach. Oh, come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you constantly focus on leaders, watering other leaders, I guarantee you God will open doors for you. Because then it's not about you. It's not about whether, because you're thirsty too. Come on. You got your own personal crisis. You got your own needs. Moses doesn't even have a job. He don't have no money. He's a fugitive and a criminal, but he waters the sh Are you hearing what I'm saying? And he watered. He, he drew enough water for us. Which means to tell me he didn't draw water for himself, Meliana. He gave them water before he drank and watered the flock. Church, did you ever think about this? I don't think it even crossed Moses' mind when he was doing it. You know one of those shepherds became his wife? I bet he never thought that. Come on. You know that flock that he watered? He eventually owned that flock. I bet she never even crossed his mind. Because I, I hear people all the time, oh, God, I want God. I pray for promotion. I pray for promotion. I pray for open doors. Let me just say, start watering your shepherd. Start watering the flock. Stop water, start, start, start watering other people and watch God promote you. Because I have found this out. You know what? I mean, uh, Pastor Renee was there. We were at this uh, conference in Hawaii, and, 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 and I was hoping to go back home. I, was hope, I really was hoping to go back home for a day, you know, and uh, get rid of my Iceland clothes. Because I had to drive my, drag my Iceland clothes all the way to Hawaii. I didn't need them in Hawaii. I mean, I, I, I thought, you know what, wouldn't it be a prophetic act if I showed up in my Iceland clothes? Come on, on the stage. They really would have, they would have probably told me to get off. Come on. But I thought about it, you know. And, and, and um, but Pastor Morocco called and wanted me to come over his house. And the reason why I came over to his house is not because I didn't, because I didn't want to go home. Because you know why? I wanted to water my shepherd. I wanted to water my shepherd because he has watered me and watered me and watered me and watered me and watered me for 40 years. I owe it to him to water him. He said, I want you to come, John. I didn't want to come. Come on. I've been in meetings all week. I, I've been on the plane. I, 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 we, we had to have, which meant I had to have a red eye the next night and then, and then land and then go to preaching right the next day and the jet lag and all that. I didn't want to do that. But guess what I did? I had to water my shepherd. Come on. Are you hearing me? And because I had to water my shepherd, you know what? He, he pulls me aside and he tells me, Prophet John, Whatever you need me to do, let me know. Now, I know he's being nice, but I did appreciate that. But I guarantee you, you'll make a lot of friends watering people. 
people will want you to be around them watering. And I honestly believe that God was looking at Moses. Moses, if you can water those shepherds and you can water the flock in the condition that you are in, you will water a nation. Could it be that Renee's prophecy over Pastor Tom and Cindy was that new life, Bowling Green, supposed to water nations? Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So that's going to require us to get out of ourself. That's going to require us to say put our personal problems on the back burner and put watering the flock on the front burner. That means that we're going to have to start being more responsible. That means that we're going to have to kind of be better stewards of our time, our resources, and our energy. Because everything about the, in the kingdom is about stewardship and responsibility. And I look at uh, uh, Moses' stewardship and responsibility with that situation. N now, this is even before the burning bush, ladies and gentlemen. But what happened after that? Well, after that, all of a sudden, Jephro realized, well, if he can do that, we need to bring him part of the family. Come on. Because I don't have any sons. I have, there's no man. In there. And if, if he doesn't continue, if he doesn't continue watering the flock and watering my daughters, that, 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 that pattern will continue. That's why some of us, are, God's going to raise us up in ministry to break the pattern of dysfunction. That, we, that we're going to pray and prophesy and worship and preach the word. And we're not have to do this funny stuff like they're doing around the country to draw people into the house of God. What we're going to do is going to water people. Can I hear an amen right now? So what happens? I'm going to start bringing, I'm going to land, start land this plane. What happens? Well, the very flock that he is watering. Because God's training him to become a shepherd. And one day, it took him a long time, but God's not in a hurry. And Moses was content being a shepherd of that small flock. He never complained about his position. But my Bible says in chapter 3 that he's walking up the mountain one day. And as he's walking up the mountain, he stops because he sees an unusual sight. Actually, the text says a strange sight. That's why I wish the church would stop trying to conform to this world and become a strange sight. How many know that we need to be a strange sight? You know what, because I don't mind all of you jumping around, running around, screaming, strange sight. You know, when I saw Pastor Renee, I'm thinking, am I in Hawaii? I'm not in Hawaii, I'm in Kentucky. That was a strange sight. You know what I'm saying? Because I've never seen her outside of Hawaii. That was a strange sight. But we need to be a strange sight. So Moses sees this strange sight of this bush on fire. Everybody say bush on fire. Turn to your neighbor and say bush on fire. Can I tell you tonight there's going to be a release of holy fire in this house? That the holy fire, because, and when I talk to you about the holy fire is this. Because the bush on fire doesn't just speak of God. It has the yes in the context, it's of God, but guess what? It speaks of what the church is supposed to be, what the church is supposed to look like, what the church is supposed to sound like. Come on. The church is supposed to look like some a person that is fully, fully burning for God but not consumed. You're not ashes. You're alive. You're living. You're breathing, but you're full of fire. Oh, come on. Let her, Liliana, let's go see a strange sight. Church, we had revival in 2011. I praise God for that time. I say, oh God, are you going to do it again? Every time I come here, it brings back memories. Are you going to do it again? Are you going to do it again? And the Lord says, I'm going to do beyond what you saw in 2011. 
I'm going to do what beyond what you saw in 2000. You thought you saw something in 2011? That was just the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. Because what I'm raising up, I, I, I'm raising up people. Oh, I feel like preaching right now. Because I think that sometimes, sometimes we can live in the past. But God wants to bring a fresh fire right now. He, he, because sometimes that bush is smoking and not burning. Oh, come on. And we're gazing at the smoking bush rather than realize that God wants to do a new thing and God wants to do a greater thing and, and he wants to accomplish more than we can ever imagine. You know, this revival brought this building. Come on. That revival brought this building. We wouldn't be in this building because we were over there. I mean, I walked in there the other day. I couldn't believe we met there all those years, you know. I couldn't believe we even met there. But what attracted people? Strange sight. A strange sight. Because how could God heal in the Bible Belt? How could God heal when most of the town are sensationists? How could God heal when, when people don't believe in miracles and signs and wonders and prophecy and deliverance? Oh, come on. How could God do that? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he, oh, come on. And there still is a bush burning. But maybe we're not looking for it, Meliana. Maybe we're too busy to have our head down. Maybe we're too busy content with just our small flock. That maybe we need to look over at that strange sight again. Well, it's a representation of the church fully on fire but not consumed. And yes, it's a representation of God. And he says, let us go see this strange sight. And he walks over there, Meliana. And when he walks over there, I mean, who can make that? You can't make this stuff up. God has a wild imagination. And he says, as he approaches that bush, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. How many want this ground that you're standing on tonight to be holy ground? To be sacred ground? Church, I realize there's a lot of organizations and institutions in America. But what grieves me is this has people look at this ground as an inter, ground for entertainment rather than holy ground. And you got to understand I'm old school Pentecost. Come on. And I don't care if you wear a suit or jeans. I don't care if you don't wear makeup. Come on. I don't care if you wear a dress. It doesn't bother me. I just came from an old school place. I told my wife, I told my wife, honey, if you is like them ladies, you know what? You can get ready faster. Come on. Because <laughs> the other day, poor, poor, I felt so sorry for her. I mean, she, she had that big. Okay. I'm not. Never good. But, you know, sometimes he, 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 I can't get my eyelash on right, you know. And then the eyelash is right here, you know. It's going like this. <laughs> What's up with that? But church, that, that, uh, I'm just kidding, but at the end of the day, how many know we have to have something sacred in America, something sacred in our heart, something we can go to that's holy? You're standing on holy ground. Take your shoes off, bro. He did. Because, no, you know, you don't really get talking bushes every day. You know, you, that doesn't happen every day. And he knew it was God. So when God takes, tells him to take his shoes off, God then tells him what he's going to do. Now, we've only got so much of the conversation recorded, but, Meliana, what I do, do know that... When he, take his shoe, when he took his shoes off, he never put them on again. Because I know something. Once I get 
have an encounter with God, I'm never the same. This, morning, this afternoon, I got an opportunity to write in my sixth book that I'm writing. I haven't written in a while, and I got to write, write for a few hours. It was just such a blessing. And I was writing about the fact that that story in Isaiah 6, where it said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I don't know about you, but I, I want to see the Lord high and lifted up. He's above my problems. He's above, he's above politics. He's above COVID. He's above my finances. He's above the U.S. immigration. He's above my eyelashes. <laughs> he's above everything else. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He's above cancer. Are you hearing? He's above sickness. He's above the demonic. He's above abortion. He's above every problem known to man. He's above every, every leader on this globe. He is high and lifted up. Is there anybody in the house of God that believe that he is high and lifted up? That means that, that it took a prophet to remind Israel that he's not, he's not indifferent. He's not a God that doesn't know where you're at. He's not a God that's nervous about the election in 2024. He's a God that is high and lifted up. In the year the king Uzziah died. You know why he died, Maliana? Because the house of the Lord was not holy. The house of the Lord was not sacred. The house of the Lord was a place where he could do whatever he wanted. Just because, he, just because I'm a prophet doesn't give me permission to do whatever I want in a God's house. Are you hearing me? My Bible tells me that king who had, had tremendous success, he had, he had wealth, he had an army, he had tremendous favor with God, decides he's going to go into the house of God and take the incense from the priests and offer incense to God when that was not his function and that was not his job. And the, pre, the man of God pleaded with Uzziah, don't do this. And he gets judged with leprosy and now has to go into isolation because when I don't put things, then I don't honor things that are holy and sacred. My, 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 my punishment is isolation from my purpose. And so what happens is now he dies and God shows the prophet something so powerful. And he is enamored by this beauty of the throne of God. Because you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, he lived in the day and age when people called good evil and evil good. You know anything about that? You know anything about that? And sometimes we can get so caught up, ladies and gentlemen, in the evil and fail to see that there's a man, there's a king sitting on a throne. John 12, 41 says, Isaiah saw him, saw Jesus in all his glory. Oh, come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So any other religion that says he's just a prophet or just a good man is a false religion because Isaiah, that's what Isaiah saw. And when Isaiah saw, he fell on his knees and said, woe is me. I'm undone. Woe is me, I am done. What's the first thing that he experiences in the presence of God, Meliana? Conviction. And sometimes I think we need the conviction to come back in the house of God. We need a holy conviction. Come on. 
Because without conviction, all we'll have is we'll do whatever we want in God's house. Oh, let the fear of the Lord return to the house of God. Let holy conviction return to the house of God. First thing he feels, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. You're talking about a prophet of God. And if Isaiah said he was unclean, what does that make us? The most articulate, prolific prophet of his age, of his day, saying, I'm unclean. And he thinks he's done because his eyes have seen the glory of the king. But this is what happens, and this is what's going to happen to you tonight. Then one of the seraphims came and grabbed, grabbed a coal from the altar of God. Pastor Tom, when I was writing today, I was praying for this altar. You know what I was praying for? God, let there be live coals at the altar in New Life Bowling Green. How many believe that this can be a place where there's a live coal? Not a frozen coal, not a dead coal, not a coal from the past, but a live coal. A live coal, a living coal, a burning coal. That when people come up in this altar, they are touched by one of those coals. When people come and they're experienced, when they come up to worship, a live coal comes and touches their mouth. Oh, come on. Touches their lips. And instead of being a spokesman from the devil, they become a spokesman for God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Instead of, instead of speaking things that we cannot repeat over this microphone about how justified we are to have entertainment on the platform, now they become the oracles of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He touched my lips and cleansed my sin. Now, let me just say this before I move on because i got to wrap this up. I can tell you this. The live coal does not cleanse your sin. The blood of Jesus does. Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And then... When that coal touched his lips, I spent three hours writing on this next verse. He said, he heard a sound. Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? Because God is looking for a messenger, not with an idea. There's a lot of people that have good ideas. God is looking for a messenger with a message. Bonnie, you are carrying a message. You are God's messenger. God has raised you up as God's messenger with a message, not an idea. Because I know a lot of people that want to have a message, but it's just an idea. They, they think they're a messenger, it's just ideas. And guess what? Isaiah says, here I am. Not only am I available, God, but I'm accountable. Not only am I accountable, that I'll do whatever you tell me. I'll say whatever you want to say. And when, and when I say something that the Lord says, I don't have to take it back. Oh, come on. I'll call out what it call out. I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about public opinion. I'm not worried about public backlash. I'm going to speak your word because I know it's your word that changes the human heart. Oh, come on and give God a shout of praise. Here I am. Here I am. Send me. Everybody say, send me. Send me. I'm asking the Lord to send you. I'm asking the Lord to send me. And you know what? It's interesting. We don't, have to, we don't have to put that up. When God, when, when he said, I'll do this, God says something like, hate me. what in the world? I'm going to send you to a people who will not listen. They don't understand. 
and they don't see. Are you hearing me? Welcome to the ministry. Welcome to, welcome to the ministry 101. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to understand you. And they're not going to see what you're talking about. Are you hearing me? That's why most people, sometimes they get in the ministry, it's not what I thought it was. <laughs> honestly, let, let me be real transparent with you. In 2021, honestly, I thought Meliana and I were going to go to Tucson and revival would break out like it broke out in 2011 in Tucson. I mean, here in, here in Bowling Green. Well, guess what? Didn't happen. I was sent to a people who did not understand, who did not hear, and did not listen, and did not see. I spent the first year just marrying people that were living together. <laughs> oh, come on. I just try, I, 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 I'm just going to counsel you, brother, so you don't run guns across the border anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm thinking in my mind every month, every month I go, every, every month, every, uh, I go back home and I, I go to the church and I come back home and good God, why would you call me here? <laughs> But then I realized, I didn't ask, you didn't get to choose whom I called you. Because I'm testing you like I tested Isaiah. Are you still going to prophesy? Are you still going to preach? Are you going to still trust me? Even when they do not understand, even when they do not listen, even when they do not see, are you still going to be faithful? Oh, come on. Or, 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 or you just want people that like you. Or you just want people that see and people that hear and people think you're the greatest prophet that ever lived. Or are you going to go to people that they show up when they want to. They give when they want to. I know this. And you want to slap them about five times. Well, come on. And I never heard, Meliana, I ne when, when God commissioned him, when Isaiah said, here I am, send me, he meant it. You know, Pastor Renee told us that she's going up to Louisville to, to prophesy over a friend that gets ordained. And there might be people that get ordained that think everything's going to be well. But how many people are getting ordained to go past their church where they're not going to listen, they're not going to understand, and they're not going to see? I'm not trying out for that church. <laughs> I don't want to go to that church. I never heard Isaiah say that, Meliana. Do you know why? Because that same bush that Moses experienced was the same fire that touched the lips of the prophet. Can I hear an amen? How many want to water the flock? How many want to water the flock? How many want to water the shepherds? How many want to water people? Lift your hands toward heaven all over the room tonight. God, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light upon our path. And I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy.